Yeah, it's Haas, isn't it? And um, <coughs> I've worked with the uh, BLM Forest Service for 34 years. And, uh, my uh, background is in forestry and forest management early on. Um, I have a uh, master's degree also in, in uh, forest pathology, forest insects and disease, and a PhD in forest science. And, I started in research in 1995 looking at uh, vegetation and vegetation growth relative to climatic conditions and uh, stand and vegetation conditions throughout the West. Worked on uh, many, many, many uh, different types of research projects relative to climate and vegetation. So uh, let's get started right into this. Uh, Mike, Paul asked me to talk about uh, this because I, I was climate and forest because I was talking to a group of foresters a uh, few months ago. He was interested in maybe you guys uh, listening to something. But I, I shortened it up a little bit and uh, changed it such that uh, it's a little easier to, to go through. I do have some graphs. and I, I don't mean to belabor the graphs and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, I put them up there just to make certain points. And, and I'm not really speaking on climate change per se. Uh, this is not a political, uh, I don't have any agenda. I work in the science realm and uh, I'm just going to present the science of the history of how uh, vegetation changes relative to climate, to climate change. And first, what I'd like to do is just talk at the big picture. Before you start, yeah. Yeah. Um, just for the record, do you work for anybody? No. You're this is all independent? By I'm, I'm, I, did, I retired in January of uh, this year, so no, I'm not working. Oh. I haven't done any consulting work yet. I was thinking uh, the county asked for a $1,600 fee to, to start a uh, business, so I couldn't do it. Couldn't afford it. I don't know if you know about that. <laughs> you, have to, you have to apply for a permit to operate a business from your home. Right now. <coughs> It's so expensive. But, I, but anyway, um, I'm just going to talk first about the big picture of climate change. What factors influence the, the climate over the long haul for thousands of years? And then bring it down to um, more recent cycles and where we're at in, in these cycles and how it affects vegetation on Earth. And so basically, there are major factors that influence the climate over long periods of time. Celestial orientation, that's the position of the sun relative to the earth. Uh, the sun itself, how much energy the sun puts out. The earth's magnetic field is also influenced by the sun and changes weather, weather patterns on earth. And the configuration of the continents, they drift around and they change ocean currents, which change climates over a, a long period of time. And geologic processes, like weathering of rocks and, and interaction of uh, ocean and carbon dioxide. Volcanic activity uh, can, can change climate as well. So, in the big picture, and there are bigger pictures than this, but the eccentricity cycle of the Earth, this is uh, the Sun here, um, is about a 105,000 year cycle. And the Earth goes through an elliptical orbit around the Sun, and it goes less elliptical to more elliptical, less elliptical to more elliptical. So, there's only a six degrees difference at the narrowest point in that uh, elliptical orbit, all the way to a 30% difference in solar radiation. And when that happens, it results in cold uh, weather during the extended elliptical cycles, and hot weather during uh, the less elliptical cycles. These cycles are what are responsible for glaciations and what some people call ice ages. Ice ages are technically a little bit different than glaciation because they, they can last for a longer period of time. And these are roughly on a 100,000 year cycle. And uh, we're right in here. We're just coming out of the last, we're not coming out, we're about mid interglacial right now. The last glaciation from the, from the Holocene period which started in the last glacier was about 14,000 years ago. When we look at ice cores in Alaska, we see how the temperature, uh, that's the blue line on here, has has uh, reflected this uh, orbit of Earth. This is carbon dioxide, by the way, on the, on the red line here. 
which is a response variable to temperature change. So as the temperature goes up, carbon dioxide goes up correspondingly. It lags behind a few hundred, a few hundred years sometimes. And what's the, uh, how is that correlated? Um, as, as temperature goes up, there's more vegetation. The, the ice recedes from, a, from the glaciation. You have more surface area of the earth and vegetation. And respiration of all the plants on, on earth picks up. It starts to respire more. Uh, carbon dioxide as a byproduct starts to uh, to track the biological activity as it increases on Earth. I'm not sure why this is going to And there's, uh, there's evidence of different sea level um, terraces uh, throughout the, uh, the continents from glacial post uh, previous glacial glaciations. Then there's the ubiquity cycle, which is the Earth's tilt on its axis. We all know it has a little tilt to it. But it wobbles from 22 about 22 degrees to 24 and a half degrees. And that cycle is about 41,000 years, changing the climate considerably on Earth. And as it does that, you have the, the northern uh, latitudes <coughs> tilting more towards the sun. And you have uh, this, the equator uh, pretty much constant. So it oscillates back and forth. The solar radiation on the north half of the Earth and the south half of the Earth changes considerably. And you get increased moisture because the differential between the equator and the tilt, the angle of the northern hemisphere, for example, is much less during a, a full tilt. We're about halfway in there. And then we have the what's called the uh, ubiquity of the eclipse, and that has to do with the rotation of the axis of the Earth has a wobble on it that goes, if this is the sun, it goes right to there, all the way back to the other side. And that, that wobbles a 44,000 year rotation, responsible for many of the of the advances and retreats of, of glaciers that take, uh, some of them, uh, alpine glaciers, could take uh, many, many centuries to advance and retreat. And then there's another one where we're getting down shorter and shorter cycles, and this has to do with the position of the Earth at the equinox. And it has to do with the, the fact that because of the centrifugal force of the Earth, it's a little fatter at the equator than it is this direction. So it has a little wobble to it, about 22 minutes a year, which equates to a, 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 about a 25,000 year uh, cycle. Um, and it has a, a position relative to the summer equinox. In other words, the, the Earth at, at the furthest point is further away at the, at the summer equinox when it should be the hottest and closer um, halfway through that cycle when it should be the hottest. And then it affects winter as well. Sometimes these cycles, here's three of them, uh, offset one another. Sometimes they complement one another. If you happen to be, uh, you know, scientists have run these out to see when the next big one will get in terms of the long cold periods. And uh, it, if, if they're complementing one another, they can complement one another on a warm cycle or a cool cycle. Uh, but Generally speaking, the, the, uh, the ice, the cold cycles prevail for the most part. And the contemporary warm period in these cycles started right about here, about 1551, or mid-1500s, the contemporary warm cycle. That's what's referred to as where we're at now in terms of the northern hemisphere and point. And then solar. The solar output is a major deal in, in terms of how it affects vegetation. And there are a number of cycles. The solar output cycles are responsible for a lot of things. And the El Nino we've all heard about, and the North Atlantic Oscillation, and uh, droughts and rainfall and flood as, as uh, solar input influences uh, the climate on Earth. And this is a study that um, was looking at a reconstruction of uh, hemispheric temperatures. And we've had a number of anomalies here uh, that have that are not necessarily uh, unique. In uh, similar temperatures uh, to what we have now, uh, we've seen before, and same with minimum temperatures. So 61 to 90, where there was a cold shift um, that was seen around 1600. This is a graph of solar input from sunspots, which influenced the climate and vegetation here on Earth, going back to about 1600. This uh, modern uh, minimum right here is uh, the beginning of what some refer to as the Little Ice Age. So very little sunspot, 
during that period of time. The Dalton minimum is another one that, uh, that was a very, very cold period. During this period, uh, there were uh, glaciation over Greenland. Uh, glaciers actually started to advance south from, from uh, northern Canada and British Columbia as well, but then they retreated quickly after these minimums. All related to sunspot activity. So here's kind of a, a summary of uh, the last uh, uh, kind of the Holocene period relative to sunspot activity and solar activity here. Um, we can see that we had a, a warm period, uh, we had another a very, very cold period, and then another cold period, and then we had some cool periods and, and so forth. So we had some hot and cold periods going back and forth relative to the sun. Sun's activity. When we look at uh, global change relative to sun spots, um, we can see that it, that it matches uh, very, very uh, close to the temperature as well. And here's a reconstruction of the Little Ice Age, which is just more recently, the last uh, going back to the so these are warm periods. These are cold periods. They're, they're named. They have names by the, by the scientists that have named them. And then we have today what's called the modern warm period. So we've had many, many cold periods and many, many cold periods. One of the most um, useful in terms of dating uh, a number of things relative to sun and solar activities has to do with tree rings and how sun activity is, is captured in tree rings. And the 11 and a half year sunspot cycle is global. It's measured uh, um, in dendrochronology as, a, as a, uh, an increment that can be identified through time for dendrochronology studies. So you can, you can cross date periods of time going back in history using this 11 and a half year sunspot cycle that's recorded in trees. But then there's another cycle, the 22 year hail cycle on the 87 year Wolfgang Leesburg cycle. So all recorded in in tree rings as a result of, of, of celestial and then sun uh, input coming into the earth over the last uh, 2,500 years. So the, the Pacific, uh, uh, the PDO, the Pacific Decade uh, Oscillation, uh, can change temperatures here from 1 to 2 degrees uh, over a, a period of time. Uh, it can change the path of the jet stream. And, also, the Columbia River reports about a 15% increase in, in runoff from the, from the Pacific Oscillation, which is related to the sun's motion uh, around the mass of the open side of the Earth. So the, here's, some, here's a summary of the, some of the cycles from the 105,000 year cycle that I mentioned all the way down to an oscillation cycle, which is about 3.8 years. And as you can see, there are a lot of them, and they can be occurring at, at, at the same time and like I mentioned, complementing one another, they could offset one another. So it gets very, very complicated when you're trying to predict how solar activity is going to change the temperature and precipitation. This is a graph from combining uh, all of the sources that were available to reconstruct temperature one. And, and you can see it's uh, pretty predictable. This is a uh, more recent one. This is just the Holocene period. This is right at the end of the last glaciation, 12,000 years ago. It actually started right in here. And then we had a really warm period. And then we had the post interglacial maxima right about here, which is still about four degrees warmer than what we're seeing currently. So we, we have had warm climates, much warmer than what we have now, just in the, in the last, uh, during the Holocene period. Now this is a study that was conducted by uh, some folks from the University of Oregon here in the Siskiyous. Now, now I'm bringing it down to the, to the Southwest Oregon and how these climates have affected the vegetation and the forest through time. This study was uh, in Southwest Oregon and Northern California where uh, grills at all poured uh, bogs and lakes in the Siskiyou Mountains um, and then using pollen analysis and charcoal analysis and carbon dating reconstruct and fossils reconstructed the climatic shifts and vegetation as a result of that, uh, that analysis. 
And um, this, this is an example of their data, their char analysis going back in time. So they have long cores, and then they look for charcoal and fossils and uh, pollen as evidence of changes in climate. And using these species, we're able to, these are reference species. So for example, if, if, if there was a period in time with white oak uh, pollen, um, it would indicate a very, very dry uh, environment. If it were a white fir, this is a border, uh, a wet environment for a period of time. And they measure the length of time and the species that existed on the landscape. These are very hot. These are shrub species and grass species. The Cianothus is also um, on the list, which is um, representative of Chaparral. And this is kind of what they came up with uh, in the Siskiyous, anyway, in southwest Oregon. Going back to the beginning of the Holocene, we had cold, wet, dry, cold, very hot and dry for a period of time. That's referred to uh, oftentimes as, as uh, uh, the hypsothermal period, where sage and uh, sclerophyllous brush, like sagebrush, migrated over the Siskiyous all the way from the Great Basin in Southern California all the way into the Willamette Valley and back again. So there was a period where we had very, very hot time. Cold alpine glaciers, hot, cold, hot, cold. You can see it kind of, it's gone back and forth through, through a period of time. And the graph showing how this is the, the one lake here, how these species um, were represented through time and so how they moved back and forth. More cedar, for example, right there, and more spruce and so forth. And that's another example of the species coming and going through time. These are tree species. And so there are a number of things that affect the migration of the vegetation as, as uh, influence the, uh, the rate at which vegetation moves. And so after glaciation, you have um, kind of recolonization. You have a cool period. The catabactic winds or the cold air coming off the glaciers keep, even though you don't have a glacier, you get cold air. And uh, you have refugia in, in mountains where seed dispersal will kind of originates. And so it moves around based on um, its certain characteristics, how far the seeds disperse, what kind of animals disperse them, and so forth. It took, for example, about 12,000 years for, for lodgepole pine to migrate from California to its current uh, range in, in Canada. Uh, it took about 3,000 years for um, spruce to migrate from the Appalachians all the way into Minnesota, and so forth. So it's a very slow process, and the vegetation lags behind by oftentimes many centuries in terms of conifers, because you can imagine the, the mechanisms that it takes to actually move it. And we know from the from research that the species that we currently have in the Siskiyous have moved up and down the slope for many, many distances for long periods of time. 800 meters up in, in species shifts, that's a long way, 500 meters down. Brewer spruce, which is a relic of the cold, wet species of tree, um, now only found in little isolated pockets that have that haven't burned or protected areas uh, were very abundant at one time. And hemlock is a, is a good uh, measure of, of climate. And um, there's a lot less hemlock in the last uh, 1,500 years. So there's a number of other, other things. But one of the things that they, that's pretty um, accepted is that the climate, the, the shift in vegetation species lags behind the change in climate. It takes a long time to catch up with it, sometimes 400, 600 years before you actually see a shift in the species composition of a forest. And it never really does catch up. There's always state of flux. The climate's always changing while things are trying to catch up with it. And the, and the uh, environment, the species on the landscape are in a continual competitive state. They're all competing for resources to survive. And as the climate changes, some have better resources and more available resources, so it shifts one way or another way. Winners and losers. And Roy Datling from the University of Oregon is a pretty famous uh, geographer who studied the southwest Oregon vegetation migration from um, starting in the 68th or 75. He's published a lot of papers if you're, if you're interested in that. And uh, he's the one that uh, published about the chaparral moving all the way up to 
in the Latin Valley over the Siskiyous. So this, at one time, this valley was the chaparral sagebrush. Now locally, we have a Mediterranean climate. This is, of course, Oregon right here, which has to do with a number of things. I won't get into them, but um, it's the 40th uh, parallel phenomenon. The globe above the equator creates wherever you have a, not wherever, but the uh, coastline entering and touching a continent, like right here, that's where we are, uh, there's a, a phenomenon that creates a real hot, dry summer and cold winter, or wet winter, I should say. And that influences our vegetation. Here in, here in Southwest Oregon, about uh, 50, 50, 50 of the years, we have 60, greater than 62 days without precipitation. So that's basically the controlling factor for vegetation, is how, how many days for Southwest Oregon can plant communities survive without water? Not the average annual global temperature, and not uh, uh, you know how cold it is or those sorts of things. Um, at night in the summertime, it's how long can these species go without water? And that's why we see such abrupt shifts in the siskiyous and here, like the Applegate, for example, from one side of the mountain to the other side of the mountain, you can have a, it's such a abrupt a change in vegetation because of the limitations of water. And as these minor shifts. Uh, push the vegetation, it can make a big difference in southwest Oregon. A lot less difference on the coast range, for example. And extremes. Extremes will reset the clock. This was a, the all-time low, which was broken this year in Paisley, Oregon. and went to uh, 58 below zero, um, which eliminates, if you have that type of uh, cold weather, you can eliminate a lot of vegetation. <laughs> Those that survive a competitive and the very next day, in this case, it was, it was uh, 100 degrees warmer. So that's pretty extreme. So these extremes have a lot to do with how the regulating vegetation as opposed to averages. For example, this is the, every, for every species, there's a climatic optimum. It's the climate which is the best for it, and then it tails off as it, as it becomes less favorable on the fringes. And this is an apple. This is what I was uh, referring to in the apple game. You have a, a very uh, abrupt change here on the slope. This isn't a clear cut, this is just uh, vegetation in a natural state. Where you have a little more moisture, a little less exposure, it's able to survive there. But if you shift this climatic optimum over to here, then there are going to be winners and losers, and you're going to see dead and dying trees in the landscape, and you're going to see some that are more favorable. This is an example of, of uh, true fur moving down the slope uh, as a result of a warming trend. And this is, a, this is an example of uh, trees and now finding themselves in drier uh, circumstances on, on the way out, giving way to, to chaparral species and understory species. That's a bark beetle, and as trees, the tree's resistance to um, insects and disease is directly related to the amount of water that it has available to it. It's called oleo resin pressure inside the tree, and this is a bark beetle. Uh, and bark beetles uh, can invade weakened trees as the climate changes, or as, in, in some cases, drought, uh, where trees don't have enough water to resist or to pitch out these insects. And the insects carry fungus, which, which then can kill the trees. So that's why we see outbreaks of insects and disease during drought periods and drought cycles. So how does the climate change for Southwest Oregon? This is NOAA's data for us in terms of average annual temperature. You can see it hasn't really, we don't have any change here in southwest Oregon in terms of average annual temperature in the Siskiyous anyway. And the, the variability is so great. So we went from an average temperature of 56 degrees in 1934 to uh, 45 degrees in 1955. So that's 10 degrees. So anything around here is, is normal. We, we tend to use normal, I think, uh, in many cases, incorrectly. We, we, it'd be better talking about an average, average, because normal is anything within the range is normal. Um, and you can imagine how many years of above average you would have to have in order for the, for the mean to actually change over a period of time. So, for example, if you had a, a year, um, let's say up here, at uh, one year, it would, it, it would seem like a very hot year, but if, if uh, it's still well within the mean, it's well within the 
there's an influence in carbon and carbon dioxide. Um, these are some graphs pointing out the, um, the effects of carbon dioxide and how you might look at it. And, uh, and this, on this side, this is the total. This is the total greenhouse combination of. Uh, 90, about 95 percent of the greenhouse gas is, is water vapor, and uh, the remainder is uh, carbon dioxide and methane and fluorocarbon uh, and uh, a few others. If if you eliminate the water vapor, then and expand this right, this right here to um, a full 100 percent, then you can see that those become much greater. For example, it's this is now about 75 percent carbon dioxide, as opposed to one of the other vapors. So anyway, what is the effect of that on trees and, and, and plants? In ecology, carbon dioxide is not necessarily a pollutant. It's one of the most limiting nutrients in vegetation growth. And when added um, in, in the laboratory, anyway, um, carbon dioxide increases plant growth substantially. The rate of growth. Resistance to diseases and insects um, is also enhanced by carbon dioxide. It does have an effect in terms of greenhouse gas, um, capturing greenhouse gases we, we hear all the time. Um, but as uh, temperature rises, as a result, there's more water vapor that uh, is involved in it. It gets rather complicated because as water vapor increases, then temperature can increase. But as temperature and water vapor increase simultaneously, then there's or albedo or reflection of light back out of here. So there are some regulatory mechanisms on Earth to deal with this in many ways. Uh, there are times on Earth when carbon dioxide was 24 times what it is now. These are some examples from our ecology data. We've been collecting data on growth. Uh, this is just, uh, this was the maximum height of of uh, Western Hemlock, um, recorded in, in, in Washington. My colleague uh, there had, had measured that. This is what the maximum height was expected. No hemlock could grow faster than that. And yet, uh, we're starting to see trees grow at a, a rate that are that is higher than what was perceived to be the maximum. And here's a, a Western Hemlock a sword fern. And we we uh, characterize these vegetation communities by their climate because the, the climate is what allows that particular assemblage of plants to exist there. So this is one here in Southwest Oregon that you can see we're seeing uh, accelerated growth in these, in these plants that is not predicted. Um, probably attributed to carbon dioxide, but we can't really say that for sure. And I found this kind of interesting. This was a, a, a research paper. Um, from, a, from a journal um, in, in Ireland that was suggesting moving a comet um, large enough uh, behind the moon to, to uh, create enough dust to cool the planet down if we have a lot of climate change. I, I just do that. That's pretty, not, what could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, yeah. Bring a comet over and park down there. But anyway, they're looking at that. That's all I have. Questions? I had a question about the uh, CO2. Yeah. On, in your experience, when, when we talk about lab research with CO2 versus right. climate, do right. we, in the research, usually they increase the CO2 dramatically, and like if, if you were to have a greenhouse. Right. And so, is there any studies on like what? There are comparatives, especially on, on the Midwest. We're doing uh, a number of studies. I don't. I don't know any that are uh, on forests, specifically with CO2 in the Pacific Northwest, other than laboratory studies. But in agriculture, there's a, there's a lot of monitoring going on there. We're looking at increased soybeans, we're going at corn in, in South Dakota, they're looking at increased growth. And so even with the slow progress of CO2 so in it's, atmosphere, And it's there's a, there are deserts that are starting to show um, a greening deserts worldwide um, as a result of more, probably a result of more CO2 in the atmosphere. So there, there are a number of feedback mechanisms 
on Earth. The Earth uses more CO2, the oceans absorb CO2. It's still rising, so there's CO2 is going up faster than, than it's being utilized at this point, but if there is a lag time behind it, it's hard to say exactly what's going on. But by no means are the um, climatic cycles uh, that we see in the short term unprecedented. It was just a recent article of uh, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration put out the California drought was worse in 1,200 years. And then the meteorologist says, hey, what did you talk about that? And they, had, they retracted it and said, no, we can you know, say that, but uh, you know, we're well within that. We don't want to talk a decade ago, the droughts, even here in the last two centuries, that have been longer than decades. Yeah. Okay. On the on the NOAA slide, uh, you had the the dots where the temperature, you know, about ten degrees. The red line in the center was a trend line. It's going downward. Yes. So is that evidence that global warming it's is? It's not a significant. That line is is pretty much flat in terms of statistics. It's not statistically going down. It's just a, it just hasn't. There's no change observed in the Siskiyous. What I observed in terms was of annual temperature. Now shift in precipitation. Um, Possibly, um, <coughs> but uh, it takes so long. The average in Medford is 18.6 inches, you know, and we've, I was looking at the records, and they, and they use that as normal. Well, we're above normal, below normal. There's never been a year with 18.6 inches. It's always been higher or lower, and the average is 18.6. So it's not really normal to say that that's what we normally get. Um, so you have to be real careful where those, where you place you know, a single dot on a graph. Yeah, the point was the trend line was going down. It wasn't going yeah. up. Right, so exactly. So would, would that be evidence that global warming's a myth? Would it be what? Would that be evidence that global warming is a myth if the trend line's going down? Well, not necessarily global. That's Siskiyou's only. So um, there's no doubt that there's, there's climatic warming going on now. I, among the signs of it. Now, the, the um, you know, the the contribution to uh, anthropogenic CO2 is the, the argument. How much um, is attributed to that? Um, it's hard to say. No one really knows. The models have proved out to be very useful because they're not, you know, they can't predict the pattern. You take, this, you take all the models and you run them backwards to see if it could have predicted where we're at and, and they don't work very well. So it's hard to say. I, you know, I, I mean, that's not something I really can, can speak to other than the fact that none of these cycles that we're in are unprecedented. What has happened, though, is society has become used to um, the way things are. You know, they build their farms with their irrigation canals and their businesses and a climate and uh, a, a place in the United States that's suitable for whatever they do. And as the climate shifts, it starts to stress the resources for those folks for whatever they, for they do. So for people, you know, to them, it's like, uh, you know, it could be, I guess for some people, a, a, a shift in climate can be very serious. But in terms of ecology and nature, it's a natural thing that's been changing in the years, of course. Far extreme. You know, we're still four degrees below the interglacial maximum temperature. We're almost six degrees below the last interglacial uh, post-maximum temperature. You mentioned AGW, the correlation. I was looking for the internal combustion engine introduction in the early 1900s, what effect that would have, because there's well, a lot we've of... Well, we've had some cold periods during that elevated CO2 period as well, all the way up through um, 19, uh, 1960 through 1980, we had a real cold period that they had to be So the, the solar activity tracks more closely with temperature than CO2. If you look at the long-term graphs of, of temperature shifts from Antarctic ice cores, um, the, the, the uh, solar activity and temperature correlates real well. I and mean, if you put CO2 on there, it doesn't even, doesn't even match. Um, like I mentioned earlier, CO2 is more of a response variable than long-term temperature shift. So as temperature shifts, CO2 will shift as well. And as we look at our trend, when we say the post-Ice Age warming, right. are we, where are we on that trend? We're, we're going to be plummeting back into uh, a glaciation in about uh, seven, 7, years. Does it warm in the in the historic? Does it warm to that point and then cool? Um, no, we've already peaked on the 
the well, there are cycles. I mean, yeah. it goes up and down. But if you look at the long-term thousand-year cycle, we've already peaked, and uh, we'll be back at, and then we'll be pumping CO2 next year as fast as we can. Incentives. I don't know what's going to happen. In that. <coughs> so we won't be selling to get rid of it. We'll be selling to make it. Yeah. yeah. Well, in, in seven thousand years, but we, you know, there there is a short-term issue in terms of. Uh, Old growth forests, um, there are benefits to increased CO2 because um, it makes, the trees have more resources to fight diseases and insects and they can utilize water much more efficiently with higher CO2 levels. So forests can, it's very beneficial to forests in terms of, of resiliency and diseases and insects if they have the resources available to them, if they're not too dense and other, other, other factors are density related competition and mortality, which is which causes insect outbreaks. In terms of forest plants, it's the most limited nutrient available to them. All right, thank you. Certainly. Thank you.